Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm not sure whether or not you made any New Year's resolutions. I typically don't. I'm not really a resolution kind of guy, but I decided to this year. This year, I said, I'll, I'll make one resolution, and it's a resolution that I'm sure lots of middle-aged men make, and that was simply to be a little bit healthier. I just want to take some baby steps towards healthy habits this year. And my son is a 19-year-old who's really into fitness and health, and so he knew that was my goal. And so he, to nudge me forward in this resolution, he presented me um, just a few days ago with four sessions with a personal trainer. Four sessions with a personal trainer, which he thought was a great idea. Um, I'm not so sure. That is... That remains to be seen. Um, but yesterday was session number one. Yesterday was session number one with a personal trainer. And so I went and, and we met. And he said, hey, Kurt, today is really just more an orientation. I just want to get to know you and what are some of your goals and, and things like that. And so we talked. And then he said, hey, I need to take some, some measurements. And so he grabbed one of those, like, pinchy claw-looking things, which I've never, ever been to any situation like this. How many of you have been to some type of physical thing where they're measuring. And, and so he said, I just need to take some measurements. And so he starts measuring certain portions of my, of my body. And as he's doing so, he keeps having the same response every time. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Now, I don't know about you. I've never heard anything good come after. Nothing good ever follows. Hmm. Right, mm -hmm, about five hmms in a row. And then he says, okay, he's making some notes and jotting some things down. And he says, hey, Kurt, come over here. And we walk over to this wall and he, he looks at this graph on the wall and he says, well, Kurt, my chart says that you are in very poor shape. <laughs> and then he kind of smiles and he says, but don't worry, in no time, I will whip you into poor shape. <laughs> well, th thanks, I think. And then I thought, wait a second, I'm a youth pastor. I work with teenagers. I get insulted for free every day. Every day. I don't need to pay for somebody to belittle me. Um, but if you've made some New Year's resolutions, I hope they're off to a little bit smoother start than, than mine has been. A few years ago, my wife and I went on vacation to Chicago to visit some of our very, very best friends. We have a little tradition where one summer we go visit them, one summer they come visit us, and a few years ago it was our turn to go out and visit them. And we talked to them ahead of time and said, hey, how about if this year, before we get there, why don't you, Scott and Lynette, why don't you plan an afternoon where we'll ditch the kids and we'll just kind of go have something cool for us, maybe something a little bit beyond the pale of what we would normally do, maybe something we've never done. You guys decide what it is, and we'll just do it. And they said, great. And so we got to Chicago, and it was our, our morning to go on our adventure. And they said, hey, here's what we've planned. We've planned a tour of downtown Chicago. I thought, well, what part of awesome didn't you understand? You know, like, <laughs> and they said, no, 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 here's the deal. It's a tour, but we're not walking. We're not on one of those buses. We're going to be on segways. Do you guys know what a Segway is? If you don't, here's a picture of what a Segway is. A Segway is this electric personal scooter that really 10 years ago or so, if we were believing the hype, we were led to believe that by the year 2017, we would all be just zipping around town on our personal transportation devices because they were, they were projected to be this amazing, amazing thing. And they are. They're unbelievable. If, you, if you've ever ridden one, you hop on, and they are incredibly intuitive. You barely lean forward on your toes, and you go forward. You barely lean back on your heels, and you slow down. You barely even think and glance to the right. You don't have to steer. You just glance, and you go. <laughs> you just glance to the left, and you go. Lean forward, lean back. They are unbelievably intuitive unbelievably easy to ride, and simultaneously shockingly easy to kind of get a little bit squirrely on. You can kind of lose control in a hurry, and they know that, so before we were allowed to go on the tour, there was about 15 or 20 of us on this tour. 
the, the, the tour guide had us in this big kind of vacant industrial warehouse where he was teaching us. And we had to practice and go in between cones and back up and go forward and look left and look right. And he was working us through all of this for about 30 minutes. And about 10 minutes into it, I'm beginning to look a little bit antsy. Okay, I hear you. But, you know, I'm there with my wife. Hey, Rachel, you might want to pay attention. You know, you are a girl um, kind of thing. Just, just kind of doing that. And, um, and then, finally, it was time to go on the ride. In fact, here's a picture of us kind of at the halfway point of our journey. There we are. By the way, nothing screams tourist more than bright lime green skateboard helmets, right? But, but there we are. And a little foreshadowing, you can see myself, my wife Rachel, and our friend Lynette. We've all got one hand on the thing, one hand up, thumbs up. It's a little foreshadowing here. My, my good friend Scott. He's got the two-handed death grip, right? He is still like, uh, I'm halfway through. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, Before that moment, before we were allowed out, the tour guide says, hey, before we go out in the real world, here's just a couple really important rules. Rule number one, stay in single file. Don't pass each other. Don't play games. Just stay in single file because we're going to be on the sidewalk. There's pedestrians. We don't want to hurt anybody. We don't want them to just single file. Okay. And he said, rule number two, do not get in front of me. I'm the tour guide. Under no circumstances are you allowed to get in front of me. Okay, okay, we got that. And he said, now rule number three is, I just want to remind you that you signed a piece of paper. And that piece of paper that you signed said that you are financially liable for any damage done to the Segway. And I emphasize that because we're going to be on the lakefront And every summer, six or seven people shoot their Segway into Lake Michigan. (laughs) And should that be you, you're financially responsible. I just want to remind you. Okay, okay, we got it. So we take off and we do do our thing. It's like a three-hour tour. It's unbelievable. We go all over the place. And towards the end, he takes us up to Soldier Field, which is where the Chicago Bears play football. We go around the stadium. Then he takes us into one of the gates, and we kind of go around the inside where the concessions are and the souvenir stores. And it was amazing. And then it was time to kind of head back to to the rental place. And as we were getting ready to go back, I realized, wow, this trail down from Soldier Field is a lot steeper and windier than anything we've been on today. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, and I'm not sure how this happened, but we had stayed in single file, and we were about ready to go. We have kind of taken a stop, and Rachel, Lynette, and myself, we were still in single file towards the front, and then there's a dozen or so people in between us, and my friend Scott was somehow separated all by himself in the back. Okay. So we start heading down this windy trail. And at some point, kind of in the back of my mind back there, I hear kind of faint, just a little, little help. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm not looking to see who it is because if I look, I, you know, you know somebody, somebody needs a little help. And we go, and it, it starts getting more frequent and a little bit more intense. Little help. L- little help. Little help. And pretty soon, as I'm just kind of doing my thing, my friend Scott, out of formation, (laughs) comes zipping by. He's dragging a foot behind the Segway, (laughs) like an anchor. And he's just zipping by each person, and he's looking at them with fear, and he's like, little help, little help, little help, little help, Like like a puppy dog, zip, 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 little help, little help, little help, little help. I'm just going, bro. (laughs) Sorry. He just, he comes to a stop, maybe a foot or two behind our tour guide, who happens to be about three or four feet short of Lake Michigan. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, oh, I thought the story was going to end up with him landing in the lake which tells me a whole lot more about you than it does about my friend, by the way. And what's funny is now we see each other a few times a year, and any time we're together, any time we're together, 
I can't help finding a reason to say to my friend Scott, hey, buddy, need a little help? <laughs> you know, we're out to dinner, he's drinking an iced tea. Need a little help? <laughs> now, that story, it, it begs a question. And this might be a rhetorical question. Have you ever felt like that story is sort of a picture of life? As you've navigated life, have you ever sort of felt like there are seasons where it just seems like everybody else has it under control? Everybody else is in formation. Everybody else is sort of following the big tour guide in the sky and it's going good. And you're off to the side. The wheels are getting a little bit loose. You're not quite as in control as you want to be. And you've kind of thought to yourself or maybe even asked, a little help? I, I, I could use a little help. If that's you today, you're in good company. You're amongst friends. One of the things I so love about serving at Saddleback Church and, and being part of this family for, for almost 20 years, we've raised our, our kids in, in, in this body, in this community. One of the things I so love about us is when you look at the list of Saddleback values and they spell out the word Saddleback at the top for the S is Saddleback is a second chance grace place. Oh, I love that. See, we, we understand that in life, everybody at some point, as we're trying to figure out where we're headed, we just need a little help. Things are a little bit squirrely right now. Now, I, I need to make a, a confession about myself, and this is something I don't, I don't love about myself at all, and it's something I'm working on, um, but I tend to be a fairly critical listener, not a good listener, never been accused of being a good listener. Um, I know I'm a critical listener, and specifically, I'm critical when I'm listening to somebody who is speaking publicly, which is really ironic for me to, to have that shortcoming. But that's just one of the flaws in my, in my character. And um, a couple months ago, maybe, um, Pastor Buddy Owens, one of our great teaching pastors who spoke here last weekend, um, in addition to teaching here on the weekends once in a while, he oftentimes leads our church staff in a time of, of devotions, a time of Bible study. Every single Wednesday, our entire church staff of employees gets together for some worship, and it's kind of like we almost have church together. And Buddy will oftentimes be the person giving the encouragement. And, uh, and not too long ago, Buddy was teaching, and, and he makes this comment. And I, and I wrote it down, and, and the, the comment that he made was, was this. He said, just because you don't know where you're going doesn't mean God doesn't know where he's going. Just because you don't know where you're going doesn't mean God doesn't know where he's going. Now, as a critical listener, I, I, I draw that down, and I thought, hmm, that's all right. Not bad. I mean, I could probably say it better. And so, so I wrote it, I wrote it down. I, I wrote it down, and I want to read to you what I wrote. Now, here's the thing. This is, this is not my wisdom. This is Buddy's wisdom. I'm just making it sound a little better. Here's, here's, what, here's what I wrote down. When you don't know where you're headed, remember God knows where he's taking you. When you don't know where you're headed, remember God knows where he's taking you. So much better. Don't, don't, I mean, <laughs> so much. Now that statement, got, that statement got me thinking about what I want to talk about today. Is that in life, we so often don't know exactly where we're headed. I mean, it's just a common state that we find ourselves in. I was very recently um, talking to a college graduate, a young lady who grew up in our youth ministry. She had interned with us during, during college. She had just graduated from a great college with a great degree headed for a great career, and she was feeling extremely conflicted, a fork in the road. And we, we've all been there. College graduation is just one of those classic times. But we've all been there at different times in our life. And she was saying, Kurt, I'm really feeling rather confused because I feel like I knew what I wanted to study. My parents paid for my, my degree, and it's a great degree. But my internship in youth ministry has also made me begin to wonder if maybe I, I should do ministry as a career or a calling. And, but I don't know. I don't have clarity either way. And the more she talked about it, the, almost the, the more distraught she got. You know, really, she kind of felt like she was in this, this maze, right? 
Where's, where's the way out? There's lots of twists and turns, forks in the road. You guys have seen corn mazes. In Southern California, we don't get to wander through too many corn mazes, but here's, here's a picture of kind of a classic corn maze. And she probably felt like I'm in the middle of this maze and I could really use some help trying to figure out where I'm supposed to go. I feel a little bit lost. What I didn't understand about corn mazes, I'm not a corn maze expert, um, what I didn't understand is apparently there's corn mazes for every demographic of people. There's corn mazes for, for everybody. Here, here's one that I, I didn't know existed, but there's a corn maze for, for a certain group of people. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Couldn't resist. Um, now, like I said before, before you, there's one for every demographic. I, I found one specifically for guys like me. Here's one for, there's one for guys like me. So we're all kind of in this thing together. Now, if you've ever felt like you're in a corn maze. Things are a little bit out of control. I'm out of formation. Where is this all headed? Little help. That's, that's where she was feeling. I, I'd like to say to you what, what I said to her. Is I just said to her, hey, it's okay not to know where you're going. It's okay not to know where you're going. Because God knows where he's taking you. It's okay not to know. God knows where he's taking you. Um, if you're in your 20s or 30s today, I, I want you to hear it's okay not to know where you're going because God knows where he's taking you. If, if you're in your 40s or 50s today, I want to say to you, it's okay not to know where you're going because God knows where he's taking you. If you're 60 or above today, I want to say to you, it's okay not to know where you're going because at this point, what difference does it make? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That's, that's just low. That's just low hanging fruit, right? Low, low hanging fruit. You have to. You have to do that. You have to do it. But if if it's okay to not know where we're going because God knows where He's taking us, if that's a truth, what do we do in the meantime? Like, how do we get to where we don't know we're going? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you some things to think about is how do we get to where we don't know we're going? And I don't want to share things you can do. Today I want to share some postures from God's word, some postures that we can have, some attitudes that we can embrace on our, where, on our way to where we don't know we're going. So, so you might want to jot these down. I think on your way to where you don't know you're going, it would be wonderful if we could get comfortable embracing the ambiguity. On your way to where you don't know you're going, embrace the ambiguity. I love what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 31. Jesus says these words. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. You see, as human beings, we, we crave clarity and certainty, don't we? We crave it, clarity and certainty. In fact, Jesus knows that, and that's this verse is he's addressing our desire for clarity and certainty. Don't worry about what will we eat. I mean, that's in the most basic things of life, we want clarity and certainty. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? I find it really interesting and at times unsettling, that as people, we crave clarity and certainty, and God seems incredibly comfortable not providing it. He's almost like he's in his sweet spot when he's not providing us clarity and certainty as we navigate life. And you can think about people in Scripture. In fact, pick your favorite Bible character. Pick your favorite God moment, your favorite Jesus encounter. And you can see that that encounter, that moment, is wrapped in ambiguity. And the men or women in that moment would have loved some clarity, some certainty. Just, just a few that pop into my mind. Think of Esther. Here's Esther, who is a young woman who's married the king. Her people have been, have been slotted for extinction. Her whole people is going is to be killed. The whole nation of Israel. And she realizes, Wow. I might be able to make a difference. And her, her uncle even says, hey, Esther, 
you should go talk to the king and plead on our behalf. Perhaps you have been put here for such a time as this. On the other hand, in tradition, if you go to the king without being summoned, you could be put to death. So you might save the entire people group or you might yourself be put to death. Do you think Esther would have loved some clarity and some certainty in that moment? Instead, that moment was wrapped in ambiguity. I, I think of Gideon, this young man who the Bible says he was from, he was the weakest member of the weakest family of the weakest tribe in the nation of Israel, which was a very weak, as far as um, um, military and all that, they were very weak and they were much maligned. He's the weakest of the weakest of the weak. And he's hiding down in this valley when an angel appears and calls him mighty warrior. God has something for you. Talk about ambiguity. Wait a second, I'm down here hiding because I'm the weakest of the weakest of the weak. And you're calling me a mighty warrior and now you're saying God's got something for me. This, the numbers don't add up. I think Gideon would have loved a little certainty and a little clarity. I think of King David who as a young man was anointed and appointed to be the next king of Israel. He knew that. That was clear and certain. But not too long after he's anointed as the next king of Israel, he finds himself running for his life because the current king of Israel is jealous and wants him dead. Imagine being a young man going, wait a second, I'm supposed to be the next king. I don't even know if I'm going to live to see tomorrow. God, could you give me a little clarity, a little, little help? Here's, here's a homework assignment for you this week. I'm just going to ask you to do one, one thing this week, is grab your Bible, and at some point this week, turn to your favorite encounter that somebody has with God in scriptures, your favorite Bible story, your favorite Jesus encounter, and just read it and make a note of the ambiguity in that situation. What was ambiguous? What was uncertain? What was unclear? In what ways do I think that man or that woman would have loved some clarity and some certainty? How would I have responded in the same situation? Just do that. I think it's a good little exercise to, to let us understand and go, you know what? This ambiguity seems to be a part of our journey. Now, here's the thing. Embracing ambiguity is not meant to be an excuse for planning. You don't just quit planning because we're embracing the ambiguity. It's not license for laziness. It's not meant for us to say, oh, well, if life is ambiguous and there's not a ton of clarity and certainty as I figure this thing out, then I just might as well have a laissez-faire attitude. Whatever happens, happens. That, that's not the case at all. Embracing the ambiguity simply says, instead of trying to plot and plan and have everything lined up, maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a better way. And I think the scripture we read a moment ago shows us the better way. Let me, let me remind you of that scripture. Again, in Matthew, Jesus is saying, don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Here's the better way. Here's how you embrace ambiguity. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. That's the better way. See, if we can embrace the ambiguity of life by seeking the kingdom of God first and living righteously, he provides us everything we need. In an uncertain life, when we're in the middle of the corn maze, the promise that if we keep God first and live righteously, he will give us everything we need, that is something that you and I can count on. That is something that is certain. So on your way to getting to where you don't know you're going, embrace the ambiguity, and I think it would be wise to persevere through adversity. Persevere through adversity. I think it would be fair to say life can be a challenge. Life can be a struggle. Um, let me read to you what I think is sort of a, a job description a statement of truth about our lives. It's, it's true for the workplace. It's true for marriage, for parenting, for friendship. Second Corinthians says this. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. 
We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. You see, God wants you and I to push through and persevere through adversity. As a youth pastor, one of the most common questions I get from teenagers, and I would, I would venture to guess it's a common question amongst adults as well, is why is it that when I'm doing my best to follow the ways of Jesus, that bad stuff still happens to me? Right, the classic question, why do good things happen to bad people? Shouldn't God promise to protect us from all that stuff? Well, the opposite is actually true. Jesus says, in this world, you will have troubles. You know, there, there's the promise. That's, that's the good news for today, guys. <laughs> in, in, in this world, you will have troubles. But you can persevere. You can hang in there. When I, um, when I was growing up, I grew up all through high school playing sports. And um, one of the classic coaches' lines. It's like, it must be in the coach's handbook for motivational speeches. Um, whether we were trailing at halftime or it's the, the bottom of the seventh inning, and we're not doing so well, um, my coach would always say, it doesn't matter how old I was and what sport I was playing, something along these lines. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. My football coach. Come on, guys. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. My baseball coach. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. My badminton coach. You know, I mean, whatever, whatever sport I was playing, it was always the same motivational speech. Now, I don't know if they realize it. I think they're just trying to get us to hang in there for the next couple innings or the next 20 minutes of football. But really what they were doing is they were teaching a bigger life principle in, in, in a smaller moment. And they didn't necessarily realize it, but that's kind of how life works, Right? We practice certain things when the consequences aren't all that important so that when the stakes are higher, there's a little bit of muscle memory. We've got some history of that. And so partly because of that, I've, I've been blessed. I kind of have this don't give up, don't quit mindset. And just in, in, in all areas of my life. And I practice it in the little things. Um, I go to the dentist about once every three years. Um, because I absolutely hate going to the dentist. It terrifies me. It is an adversarial experience for me, right? It's full of adversity. Now, my dentist is a wonderful, wonderful man. He's a longtime Saddleback member um, who claims to love the Lord, which I don't understand because how can you work in a torture chamber and follow Jesus at the same time? I, but you know what? Who, who am I to judge? Who am I? He, I'll take him at his word. But here's the thing, I go, and I don't enjoy it, it's adversarial, but I want what's on the other side. I, I know enough to know I trust him, I don't understand this whole process, but I want what's on the other side of this experience. And so I, I don't get out of the chair, right? I, I just, I hang in there. I would suggest that in life, God wants us and the scripture shows us that God wants us to recognize that life is full of adversity, but we can persevere through it with his strength. Have you ever looked at people who have been married for 50 years and you think, how, how, how has that happened? How have you made it 50 years? I think the answer may be there's more to it, but you can boil it down they just didn't quit. They just didn't quit. How do you work in one career for a long time? And how have you managed? There's so much temptation. You just don't quit. How do you raise kids? You've seen people who you see their kids have kind of gone through the, the normal challenges of being teenagers and they've come out on the other end and you say to those parents, how did you do it? We, we just didn't quit. We just hung in, we just hung in there. There's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. How do you manage being a follower of Jesus Christ in the workplace, which seems to be getting tougher and tougher all the time? There's, there's no easy answer, but I think one answer is you just don't quit. You don't get out of the chair. You, you persevere through adversity. On, on your way to getting to where you don't know you're going, embrace the ambiguity, 
persevere through adversity. But what do you do when you, you feel like quitting? What do you do when you just don't have any fight left in you? I would suggest that maybe the best thing we can do on our way to where we don't know where is to rest in his authority. Rest. Because sometimes the fight tires us out, doesn't it? And when the fight tires us out, it's okay to rest in his authority. I love this portion of scripture in Job. Now, if you're unfamiliar with who Job was, um, Job was a, a man back thousands of years ago, before the times of Christ in the Old Testament. He was a man who, in today's language, had it all. He had it all. And he lost it all. And he had just a few friends remaining, and the friends that he had remaining were making accusations against him. Hey, Job, come on. What sin is in your life to cause this to happen? Something, there's something going on or else you wouldn't have lost it all. So he is in the middle of the corn maze. He is out at the side on the Segway. Little help? What's going on? And in the middle of that, in a prayer, this is what he says. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Let that, let that marinate for just a few seconds. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. See, God has a purpose for your life. It's different than it is for my life, and it's different than it is for the person seated next to you. But God has a purpose for your life, and no purpose of his can be thwarted. Rest in that authority. Just rest in that. The creator of the universe who spoke the world into existence, who hand-knit you together in your mother's womb, has a plan for your life, and that plan cannot be thwarted. Earlier I asked you to maybe look up your favorite um, God encounter, Jesus moment in Scripture. Mine is a pretty famous one. My favorite moment in Scripture is when Jesus and the disciples are out on a boat. And at some point, Jesus decides to take a nap. He goes either to the back of the boat or down below, and, he, he, and he's asleep. And a storm rises. Now, you got to think, these disciples, the majority of them grew up either on fishing boats or at the very least, they were very familiar with water life. It was really common back then. And they had certainly seen some storms. They certainly knew how to sail. They knew the ins and outs of a fishing boat. And yet the storm apparently was so severe that they begin to panic. And they rush and wake Jesus up. And they say, Jesus, wake up, do something, we're all going to die. And Jesus goes to the front of the boat, and Jesus says the word. He just says the words, and it's calm. Scripture says the disciples look at each other and say to themselves, who is this man? Now, these are people who had seen Jesus do some miracles, and when they saw Jesus speak calm to the storm, they looked at each other, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, I want to say to you today that there is no storm in your life that Jesus Christ cannot speak calm into. There is nothing you're facing that Jesus cannot speak calm into. Jesus is never asleep on the job. The disciples thought he's asleep on the job. He's never asleep on the job. He's never asleep on the job. And you can rest in that authority. The authority that can speak calm to any storm, you and I can rest in. On our way to getting to where we don't know we're going. So if you want to get to where you don't know you're going, I think we can embrace the ambiguity, persevere through adversity, rest in his authority, and along the way, a few more things you might want to jot these down is 
I think you should remember your identity, remain in community. I love what Pastor Rick says. Pastor Rick says, there's nothing in life that good relationships can't get you through. There's nothing in life that good relationships can't get you through. So remain in community. Resist insecurity. Reject conformity. And run after humility. I've learned a long time ago, and parenting teaches you this, not to make promises. I, I've, just, I've just seen the pain of a broken promise. Um, when, when I was a younger father and my kids were younger, I just made a few too many promises that I couldn't keep, and I've seen the, 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 the consequence of that. And so I've just determined I don't make promises. I want to make a promise to you. I want to make you a promise, and that is simply this. Your life will not turn out the way you've planned. I promise you, your life will not turn out the way you've planned. How do I know that? Look at the verse at the top of your outline, Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I'm so glad I can trust the Lord more than my own plans. I'm so glad my life hasn't turned out the way I would have planned for it to turn out. So make your plans and trust God as he directs your steps. So how do you get to where you don't know you're going? I would suggest that we start by celebrating the fact that we are on a path to God knows where. <laughs> let's, let's, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this wonderful mystery called life. God, in the midst of so much uncertainty, thank you that when we don't know where we're headed, that you always know where you're taking us. Father, today I pray that you would help all of us to find confidence in that wonderful, powerful truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.